Uh, so again, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. As we know, we are going through uh, one of the most interesting times in, in this world. And um, we want to get some clarity. I know that a lot of people have expressed fear. And uh, what I want to do today is really just kind of set the expectations for what we're going to cover. And so the very first thing I want to do, I'm going to break this presentation into a couple of pieces. The first part of the presentation, I want to give you some perspective. So we're going to dive back into history because there's so many people that are, you know, talking about how this is like the end times and this has never happened before. And actually, we got some data that we're going to go back in history and study together to give us the right perspective, the right framework of how we should look at this particular situation. Then we're going to talk about what are some of the action steps that we should be taking right now as investors and individuals so that we can weather this storm. And then the last portion of this, we're going to do a QA and a and a call to action for us to really engage together and start uniting together to build an alliance so that we can all get through this together. So um, if anybody here knows me, you know that I like to teach with stories. So I'd like to start in the middle of this very serious presentation uh, with a quick little story. And um, since we're going to talk about history and in the past, I really want to just start with an old ancient history uh, story. And so... There was a man in the old late 1700s that was very well known because he was one of the most fiercest naval officers and he was such a powerful man with so much influence and he had been sent out on a mission and he had his men and he was on a ship and as he was inside of his room preparing and charting the course for where he was going to take his men uh, one of his lieutenants runs in and says captain we have a problem we have two other hostile ships heading in our direction right now. What would you have us do? So this fierce captain stands up and he says, you know what? Get me my red jacket. Ready the men or we're going to battle. So the men got up. He put his red jacket. They go outside and they go to combat and they defeat those two hostile ships with the skills of this incredible Navy officer captain. But he goes back inside as they celebrate the victory. He begins to plan again the rest of the chart of the course. And once again, his lieutenant comes back and says, Captain, we have even bigger problems. There's three more ships heading our way and they look hostile. What do you want us to do? So the captain again gets up and says, give me my red battle jacket. Let's put it on. Ready the men. We're going to go to battle. I want you to flank in this way. And so they fiercely battled and they defeated the other three hostile ships. They celebrated and all the men went back to their muster station. So as the captain is sitting back here meditating on these victories and trying to figure out an angle, once again, the lieutenant comes in and says, Captain, we have a really big problem. So the captain looks at him and says, what is it? And he says, Captain, there's at least 15 hostile ships heading our way. Do you want me to get you the red jacket? His response was very awesome as he said, actually, no, gave me my brown pants. <laughs> so the moral of this story, guys, is, you know what? In the middle of this storm, we can still have a little fun. You know, let's, let's lighten up a little bit. We're going to talk about some amazing things, but we can still have a little fun, have a little humor and really conquer this together. So now what I want to do first, as we start going into the context that I want to build here for you guys, a lot of people are saying that nothing like this has ever happened in history. So what I want to do first is I want to give you a picture in time where we've had various cycles that we have dealt with over the years. So I'm going to take us all the way back to 1797. And while we don't have time today to unpack every single recession that our country has ever had, I want to point out a couple of pieces. So if you look here in 1797 is where we really had an official first correction. Then the following one was 1857. The next one is 1873, which was called the Great Depression. It was changed to the Large Depression. Then we have an 1893 and 1907. I think you're seeing that we've never just had one recession and this is definitely not our first or last. I think you're starting to see that there's a pattern here that there are several recessions every few years, right? So now we're going to fast forward to one particular one. We go from 1907 to 1918. And I want us to look at this because a little bit later, I'm going to dive into this particular correction. And what I want to point out briefly before we move forward is that in this particular market correction, it was basically at the end of World War I. The country was financially tapped out. Soldiers were coming back with PTSD and struggling. And then some of those soldiers brought the influenza disease that came in. And so there was an epidemic. Later on, I'm going to dive into numbers and how we overcame that. But that was the first real recession that was married to a pandemic. And that's a really important point that I want to share. 
Now, after that, of course, we go to the Great Recession of 1929, followed by 1945. I think we're seeing, obviously, this trend of constant historical recessions taking place in our country. So I'm going to fast forward real briefly here so we get to now 2001. 2001 was a very unique uh, correction because that was the first tech bubble bursting. The market was impacted. And then shortly thereafter, we have 9-11. When 9-11 hit, of course, we had all of a sudden to deal with terrorism, a completely different enemy that we never faced before. And then in addition to the tech bubble and 9-11, SARS took place, which yet was another pandemic that took place. I'm going to show you some stats on that. But one of the points that I want to make before we continue is that the reason why SARS didn't explode to the level that we have right now is because they were able to control it and there were less than 10,000 people that were infected by that disease. But again, nonetheless, when you look at the picture in time, what you will see is that since 1797 to date, we have only had two corrections with a pandemic. So now fast forward into 2020, and here we are with the coronavirus. So it's important for you to note as we move, move forward here that this is the first recession in our history that literally has happened by choice. And most of us has been fear, but really a lot of it has been that we have made a choice that we want to stop doing business and separate ourselves to overcome this pandemic that is obviously spreading like wildfire. And so it's important to understand that because in all of the other major corrections, specifically the ones with pandemics, there were other factors involved that actually had already built a recession. And so this is the first one where everything actually looked good and ultimately we got hit. So now let me share with you some perspective. So let's take a look at 2001. Let's go back to SARS. And what I want you to see is when the SARS epidemic took place, yes, there were still a lot of people with the same mass that we were today. And again, it didn't explode as much, but I want you to gain a couple of pieces of information from this. When we had SARS, which was mixed with 9-11, which was mixed, of course, with the tech bubble, what we saw as far as the impact in recovery is that there was a loss of 1.75% in annualized GDP, which later on I'll explain what that means, and a 5.1% monthly loss at the peak. Now, this had a quick recovery trend after the pandemic, which is interesting because once the pandemic was under control, everything started going back to normal relatively quickly. We saw unemployment rates drop. We saw the recovery by the third quarter. And statistically, it was an insignificant hit on the real estate market because there was literally only a drop of about 1.9%. The only big number that you see here is that during the duration of the actual pandemic, properties were not listed, meaning that 33% of the market stopped transacting in real estate, which is what caused uh, some of that, that market correction. So the point that I want you to see here, guys, is that even in that pandemic with two other key components, at the end of the day, when you take a look at this, the actual real estate prices didn't drop, the number of transactions did. And that's really important to keep in perspective as we move forward in, in the next portion of this presentation. Now, let's take a look at, during this season, what happened to the S&P 500. And what I want you to notice is that during this time when there was calamity and there was a pandemic, we did have the S&P 500 drop. But after the period of time when it was under control, what do we see? We begin to see a growth stage taking place. And so again, what I want you to gain perspective on, even though we're going to unprecedented times and these are very difficult times, I'm not making light of it. The point I wanna make here guys is that this too shall pass. And so we should not be looking at this situation from the fear perspective. We should be focusing on faith and learning from the past so that we can reposition ourselves to help our neighbors and to grow financially. And in a minute, I'm gonna dive into that. Now let's take a look at the actual construction, housing starts. During the SARS pandemic, you will see that again, yes, there was a dip. And in this blip of time, activity slowed down. In the, in the form of weeks, it would have felt like an eternity. But when you look at it from the perspective of years, it really was literally a dot in a timeline. And that's what I wanna show you. Once everything was under control, once again, we begin to see that clearly we start seeing construction going back up. And then of course you see this was 2008, 2009. And here we are as we're continuing to grow from this stage. Now let's take a look at house prices. When you look at the house prices, you'll see again in this blip of time, house prices slightly dropped, but once everything was under control, look at the spike in the growth that we experienced. 
Now, looking at this picture, I do project in the future, just so that you know, that when we come out of this, there's going to be a substantial growth pattern, and I'll explain why later. But what I see is that we should be more worried about positioning ourselves so that when the market peaks, that we're not overpriced so that then we have another recession kind of like we had here. So that's what I want to be more cautious about. Now, this is something that was really interesting. I was talking to my economist about this, and this was one of the charts we put together. What I want you to do is gain perspective because a lot of people just started seeing some crazy news about unemployment filings, and I, I want to show you what that's all about. Now, if you look here from the 1970s to basically 2020, all these little gray lines that you see here represent a time when there was a small correction in the marketplace, which is literally very well connected to the peak, meaning during these times, we see a peak in unemployment filings. And you see it here, you see it here. So every small correction that you saw in the market ultimately saw a spike in unemployment. Okay, and then you can see that 2008, 2009, this is a perfect picture. And it was almost a record of the amount of unemployment filings that took place. Now, when we were talking to our economists, if this was just a traditional market correction, if we were past 300,000 going into 400,000 unemployment filings, we could have a trigger that showed that we were in a recession. But now I wanna show you something really interesting. So that's what we looked at as far as our gauge. This is what actually happened. And as of last week, we're literally looking at, this is the baseline I just showed you from the 1970s. Look at these filings that just took place. But just think about that for a minute. That is mind boggling. We're not talking about 700,000. We're not talking about a million. You're talking about over six, seven, nine million people that are filing for unemployment. Now, for most of us, you have all these people just speaking doom and gloom saying, oh my God, this is the worst time in history. And while it does look alarming, what I want you to understand is that these numbers are very convoluted. And I don't wanna talk about the president or make decisions or put words in his mouth, but I truly believe that the president knew that if we're gonna go big, we're gonna go big. And what he decided to do was to leverage the unemployment claims to get money out to people as quickly as possible. So even though you're showing over 10 million people showing that they have lost their jobs, do you know how many people are actually, they have a saved job or they have a smaller paying job, they're paying them a little bit less. And what all these people are doing is trying to tap into the government money so that they can survive through this storm. So it doesn't mean that all these people are jobless. In fact, think about all of the real estate agents right now that are selling property and the hundreds of thousands of people that had an average income that are now saying, you know what, this is the perfect time to tap into the government, file for unemployment and get a payment protection plan for myself. And so again, these numbers are convoluted, but they're still substantially large. And so we'll dive into that in a minute, but I want you to gain the perspective. When you see these numbers, these are not true unemployment numbers. You have agents that are still selling properties. You have real estate companies that are out there. You have other sales jobs that really have just slowed down in sales. And so what these individuals are doing is filing for supplemental income with the government because the government is offering money to people. Now, one of the things that we should be watching as we proceed is the month over month employment growth. Because during a correction, one of the things we wanna see is, is are the new opportunities coming in. And so we're gonna be watching this. I would encourage each and every one of you to keep an eye. The, the last one came out April 3rd. And basically it's the first Friday of every month that this comes out. And so I would encourage everybody to look to start seeing if we're going to drop under 200,000 new jobs or if we're going to see this surge. And I have a feeling that because of the way that the government has put together this program for the payment protection plan, you might actually see this number stabilize, if not grow, because this is an opportunity for a lot of employers who are dealing with uh, different programs and different staff to basically clean slate and get rid of the people that are not committed and bring in other talent that is looking for opportunities because they're gonna be literally held accountable for keeping the same number of employees in their business. Now, let's move on to this portion. Now, this is the piece that I want us to really look at and consider as we're having this conversation, okay? I talked before about how there were all these other pandemics and all these other circumstances that had taken place before a pandemic. And this was the first one that was by choice. So what I wanna do today is give you a visual piece of perspective so that you can see how strong we were as a country and as business corporate America prior to this crash. So let's begin with the banks. So if you look at 2007, right before the correction of 2008 and 9, the banks only had $44 billion in reserves. 
And you can just see now why when we had that correction, it was such a deep correction. There were no reserves. Everybody was over leveraged. Now, look at the contrast between as of February of 2020, the banks had over 1.7 trillion, not billion, 1.7 trillion in reserves. That is an amazing posture for a bank to be with reserves, which means that we were shooting in a growth stage. Now, let's take a look at the actual corporate profits. These are all the recorded profits on average showed that the annual reportings from 2007, you can see they were around here. Look at where they were as of 2019. So you can see that from an annual perspective, not only did the banks have the biggest reserves, but we also have corporations literally filing record annual profits. Does that look like a correction to you? No, it shows that corporate America was growing. Profitability was taking place. We were in a growth stage. Now, here's what's really interesting. Look at the corporate cash on hand. This is the liquidity of these said companies. Look at how much liquidity was here in 2007 in comparison to where we were now. So what you're doing here, and this is why I want to point this out, you're looking at this incredible picture of the strength of our economy prior to a pandemic that began to spread and create fear, which caused us to stop. So the reality is corporations are eager to get back to work to start generating income. And most of the companies that actually started doing different furlough programs and moving people to part time and doing certain strategic moves to make people look unemployed so they can get government assistance, what they're trying to do is keep some of this money in their pocket so that when this thing goes through, they can double down and begin to grow their business. And so that's the point that I want to make. I'm not saying that this is going to be beautiful, this is going to be pretty, but I want you to understand that this is totally different than any other correction we've ever seen because all of the pieces were pointing to growth. Now, this is the big question that if you're in the real estate space or if you're in any finance, this is the elephant in the room. Most of you might know by now that all of the private lenders that were in the space all of a sudden disappeared, left people literally hanging with loan docs signed and all, and now they're not funding. You start hearing of lenders who shut their offices, started firing people from their offices. Why did this happen? And here's why. Because what most people didn't realize is about five and a half, six years ago, private money was private. It wasn't very liquid. We weren't talking about billions and billions of dollars, but there were millions and hundreds of millions of dollars from private investors looking to get a good return investing in real estate. So the private sector was great, except it was very inefficient and it didn't have the liquidity that Wall Street had. So in about 2015 is when Wall Street said, wait a minute, this is an amazing industry. You can get very short terms, very high yields, very low loan to values. We need to dibble, you know, just start investing into this and test it out. And before you know it, by 2017, you start getting news articles like this one that say fix and flip mortgage bonds, Wall Street's new housing bet to boost home flippers. Think about that for a minute. The moment that Wall Street got involved, they weren't throwing 10 million. They were throwing hundreds of millions and then literally billions and billions and billions of dollars. I have friends that were working in an organization that were doing $120 million in private loans a month. But guess what? Because they only got in bed with Wall Street. The moment this pandemic happened, Wall Street shut everything down. I'll explain in just one second why that was so powerful. Now, the moment they hit the pause button, all of these other institutions that depended solely on Wall Street money had to stop because they no longer have a secondary market. They're out of business. They're completely shut down. And that's the reason why all of a sudden you're seeing that all of these other markets like non-qualified mortgages and other types of loans like private lending, hard money loans are coming undone because Wall Street has moved their money. Now, think about it from this perspective. Pretend that you are Wall Street and you have countless amounts of money that you can invest. At the end of the day, we all know that he who has the gold makes the rules. So now that Wall Street is backing out of all these other businesses, the government knows that these businesses are now being impacted and they immediately start to fear and say, oh my gosh, if we don't do something now to actually intervene and Wall Street pulls the money out completely from the real estate sector, we can have not a correction, but an economic deleveraging. So what does the government do? They say, hey, for the coronavirus, what we want to do is at the very least, as the government, we're going to buy all of the retail FHA VA loans that you underwrite. So where do you think Wall Street moved their money? That's right. Wall Street moved their money to government-backed mortgages. Even if the yield isn't great, 
they are guaranteed to not have risk because they're portfolio funding and selling off these mortgages. Now, how long will this last? We don't know. The reality is for the next three to six months, private money may just be private money. And that's a great thing. In fact, what I challenge you is if you literally are looking at the real estate space, com complaining about the rates, complaining about all these things, and you got all fat and happy trying to get twenty, thirty thousand dollars in wholesales. Let me be the first one to welcome you to the real real estate market, because before Wall Street, none of this thirty thousand dollar wholesale fees existed. Before Wall Street, you didn't have people complaining about low rates. They were just happy to get private money to fund their deal so they can grow their business. So what I want to tell you is, even if Wall Street would have never come back, the real estate sector through private money will continue to grow. It'll just grow slower. It'll grow more private. And I'll talk more about those terms. So again, I wanted you to understand this because it's money that drives the market. And this Wall Street money is moving somewhere where the government has to guarantee the money. And so for right now and for the foreseeable future, if you don't adapt to this mentality, if you don't adapt to the structure of real real estate investing, you're going to be out of business. And I'll give you perspective. I've even had wholesalers already emailing me saying, listen, Rick, if you'll just buy these homes, I'll just assign it for you for 500 bucks. Why are they doing that now? Because they're realizing that now all these investors that they thought were buying cash, how many of these were actually buying with Wall Street cash? And all of a sudden you have investors who did have cash who are scared because Wall Street backed out. So now they don't want to buy. And before you know it, you have this fear factor going on and you have all these wholesalers trying to pivot. You have all these flippers trying to figure out what they're going to do. And so, again, I want you to gain perspective, guys. This is the name of the game. He who understands these things and begins to put a plan in place will thrive while everybody else will allow this to punish them. So be wise and prudent as we share this information with each and every one of you. Now, from the information of history, from everything that just to give you the perspective of where we are, one of the things that I'll tell you is that we can talk about this all day long, but if you don't take action, if you don't actually implement strategies, you will be left behind and the market will literally take care of you. So what I want to challenge you now is to switch your mindset from being afraid. Stop looking at the news from a negative perspective and begin to transform your thinking into opportunities. Because the moment you think about an opportunity, you begin to take action. So what is the first action that you may say? I'm going to spend a few minutes here briefly talking about the very first action that I believe each and every one of you should take. The first action I believe every single person in this team should look at is actually the action of how do I get oxygen in my lungs. So for the first time in history, we are dealing with a pandemic that has been spreading so severely quickly that America shut down its business, which has impacted millions of people all over the United States. However, for the first time in history, our government has been so aggressive and proactive that they've put together a $2.3 trillion cash infusion and let's be honest, I don't care if you're a pastor, I don't care if you are a teacher at a school, I don't even care if you work at McDonald's, everybody has been impacted by this. And so what the government is doing now is they're encouraging us to stay home and do social distancing, which we'll talk in a minute, but to literally start to give money to these individuals that are struggling financially. So what I want you to look at is you're gonna have unemployment insurance benefits of 260 billion, 250 billion is laid aside for direct payments to individuals that are struggling right now. So basically everybody across the board is going to get some money. And in a second here, I'm going to really dive into this $377 billion that's been allocated to small businesses. Now, um, as you see, there's a website here. It's called www.rickmalero.com forward slash forecast. I'll show you in a second what you're going to get. But if you fill that form out just so that we can speed up our process, when you fill that form out, we're going to send you a bunch of information. In fact, let me toggle here to show you what you're going to get. So once you fill that form out, number one, you're going to get an uh, email with my audio book that you can download, Investing with a Purpose, which is going to really talk about even some of the historical events of market corrections and what to do. I really think is a very valuable piece of information. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to get these types of summaries. And these summaries were done by our team that has been literally working with litigating attorneys that deal with the IRS and other experts in the industry. And what they've done is they've put the time and effort to give us a summary of what you can expect. For example, on the at the individual check, this information will break down exactly what you would qualify for, what deems a qualified person, and additional resources where you can get information or apply for any support. The next one here, again, is basically the individual relief program. This right here, guys, is the very reason why you're seeing millions 
of unemployment filings, not necessarily corporations. So this is a place that I would encourage each and every one of you to look because one of the benefits of who's eligible for the first time in history for these benefits is people that are self-employed or 1099. So this is really something powerful. And if you go through here and you start seeing where you would qualify and why you would qualify, there's a list of items. There's one in particular that most people would qualify under. And it's this one right here that you cannot reach a place of employment because of the quarantine imposed. So literally, this is why you're seeing millions of people. And if you haven't done it already, I would highly encourage you to go to the, the, your state unemployment office, go online and begin to apply. Now, be patient because there's millions of people applying for this very thing. So you might get kicked out or if you want to be doing it at three in the morning, that's fine. The, the whole goal here, guys, and I'll show you how that works in a minute. Is make sure that you apply for these benefits, because even if you still have a job. Even if you're still a real estate agent and you have a pipeline, if those closings are delayed for any reason, you don't want to tap into your reserves. So this gives you the opportunity and the government has literally now invested in you to give you the ability to stay home while this passes. So I would highly recommend that each and every one of you do this. And now you can really see why I say this is convoluted because really that, that's what it is. Lastly, you have another memo that talks about actually your PPP program, the payment protection program for small business owners. Now, for you guys here, listen up. If you have employees and you pay them 1099, W2, it doesn't matter. As long as you have a payroll process in place, the government is allocating a substantial amount of money to buy you time so that you can save all of your employees. Now, here's something you don't know. I've been talking to my bankers. I have several bankers because we do a lot of money deployment. And so we have different banks and different organizations. Most of them have us in like a treasury management type of account. So they usually talk to us and serve us. And I was having a conversation with them. They just finished a big conversation. And what most people don't know is that the way that the government gave the money to the banks is they allocated 10 trillion, I'm sorry, $10 billion per bank. So Wells Fargo has been allocated 10 billion. Bank of America, 10 billion. City National, 10 billion, and so on and so forth. Now, what's happened is because of this logistical nightmare, the big banks are not happy with their payout. What does a payout mean? Well, of course, for them to process these kind of deals, underwrite them and submit them to the SBA, obviously it costs manpower, man hours, all these logistical resources. And so initially the government had allocated a half of a percent of the 377 billion for these banks, but then they estimated that their cost would be 1%. So the government increased their origination fee for one point basically on the 377 billion. However, I believe that the bigger banks were frustrated because they didn't have more allocation. And so what they have, discreetly and diplomatically done is they started stipulating that because of their lack of resources, because of the lack of ability to move quick enough to make this happen in the timeline that the government wants, they're only going to offer this to some of their more closer clients. So one example, and I'm not going to say which bank, they said, well, because we have customers that have loans with us, that have X amount of payroll with us, we happen to have more information on them. So it'd be more productive for us to reach out to those customers only and offer them the majority of these funds that are allocated. So you're gonna hear in the news of so many different people that are going to the big banks as a bank there and the banks are gonna say, sorry, your application wasn't received. And so that is a very, very big problem that I believe is gonna happen because those tens of billions of dollars per big bank is probably gonna to go to their elite groups. So this is where we come in and help. If you have not filed for the support, we have two bankers and different banks that have been amazing. They literally have already since Friday submitted over $1.2 billion in applications. So they literally have a substantial amount of money left that they have to deploy. So we have talked to them and we said, listen, if we can channel some of our clients here that want support, please give them the treatment of VIP. Please make sure that you help them with their applications and help them to, to get the support. So as a value add resource, and we get nothing for this, what I want to tell you is that if you haven't filed or if you hear back from your bank and they're like, sorry, your application wasn't able to be processed because we had too many applications, then what I want to encourage you to do is send an email, ppp at hiscapitalgroup.com. If you email me that, I'm going to forward it to our bankers and our banker will directly contact you and explain to you what they need how they're going to get going and send you the digital application so that you can get your paperwork put together as quickly as possible. Remember, out of the $377 billion, the moment that money's allocated, it is over. So the application process will go in with your banker. You'll submit the paperwork. 
they'll underwrite. Once you get pre-approved and it's submitted to the SBA, the SBA literally will allocate and remove from that 377 billion, that amount that has been allocated to you. And so again, I wanna make sure that if you struggle with this, I cannot emphasize enough. We cannot weather the storm without oxygen. So make sure you put your mask on first, we're happy to help you and make sure that those applications get through. So again, if you want all those documents I showed you, go to rickmalero.com forward slash forecast and go email ppp at hiscapitalgroup.com. Now, uh, what I, some of you are saying, well, I, I don't understand. What, what does a $2.3 trillion dollars go? So I want to give you a quick picture of what that looks like. The very first tranche of money that you see here is specifically for public health. And I agree 1000%. We need to make sure that the, the medics, the doctors, all the experts that are out there trying to fight COVID-19, that they have the tools and the resources to win, that they have the tools and resources to protect the people. And so that is where the first tranche is going to go. The second tranche, as you see here, is the individuals. So they're creating multiple programs and different pieces to help the individual. So again, you want to make sure that you're applying if you qualify for that type of support, because it will help you to weather the storm, especially if you're attending nine commission only, you literally need to do it. Now, the last portion here that we see here in, in, in yellow, this is for the small businesses. And of course, they put another big chunk of money here for the larger corporations so they keep their employees employed. So the reality is they put a lot of money out there to help, and you just have to make sure that you're proactive. Now, I want to make a point here. This is not a money grab. Understand, this is not for you to ask for a handout. This is an opportunity that has never happened in history where our government is saying, hey, for those of you that are tax paying citizens, for those of you that work hard in America, you didn't ask for this, but we're going to give you a hand up. So use this as an opportunity to raise up above the ashes and begin to reposition yourself, which is the next thing I'll talk about briefly. Now, some of you might say, well, Rick, I love that. This is great. But as a 1099, how the heck does this work? What do I do? I've heard of 20 different ways that you can apply. I'm going to give you a quick visual so that you fully understand. Okay. Now, if you are officially unemployed or if you're applying for unemployment benefits, even though you're not technically unemployed because you're 1099, what you'll do is either or you're going to apply through your local state unemployment office. Okay. Now, when they go through the process, if you truly are unemployed and you get approved, meaning you're eligible, it'll automatically kick you in, give you the state benefits, and you will automatically receive the additional PUA benefits for up to 39 weeks, which is about $600 every single week. So I'm going to say it again. If you're unemployed, you literally may be able to apply. And if you're eligible, you'll get the state benefits and you'll get the government benefits. Now, if they deem that you don't qualify, if they deem that you're not qualified for the, uh, the state level unemployment benefits, you need to push forward and keep pressing them so that they can put you into the actual PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, and then they will push you through to get the additional resources for you. Okay, so this is really important. Now, of course, if we go past a little longer than up to July, there's another program they've already put in place to give an additional 13 weeks for those who qualify. And again, I'm not saying we want to go here, but I want you to visualize. So this is the very reason why you're seeing so many people applying for unemployment. It's again, it's a grab to say, hey, I am unemployed. Give me the benefits or I am. I do have a job or I am a 29, but I'm impacted by this. So this is what this is here to do is to supplement and to help you during this time. So again, I know I took a lot of time talking about this, but I really believe that if you're going to reposition yourself to be successful in this market, capitalize on the opportunity take that hand and rise up and then grab somebody else by the hand and raise them up as well. That's the main goal of this program. It's not a handout. It's a hand up and you need to pass it on to everybody else. So now, now that you have oxygen in your lungs, what do you do? Well, the very next step is you get greedy. And what do I mean by that? I mean, be selective. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett. He said, hey, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And that is the climate that we're in right now. Everybody's afraid. And this is the time that instead of running from the opportunities, you should be running to the opportunities and finding a way to unite. And I'll tell you later about how you can do that. So if you're an investor and you're thinking about getting in the game, I'm gonna talk about what does that criteria look like? Now, if you're a wholesaler and a flipper, I wanna set the expectations that if you're going for private money in order to move your properties, that you need to understand that the game is gonna change slightly. And these are the key pieces that the real estate investors are going to be looking at. And in fact, I challenge you to take on the same philosophy, because if you do that, you will be safe. If you do that, you'll build the trust with real investors 
who will transact with you. But if you don't, and you go back to those sleazy old ways of pitching and trying to sell commission deals and trying to make $30,000, $40,000 a clip, you're going to lose out on these opportunities. So let's begin to set the expectation until the market has stability, the private money will be more conservative and a lot more expensive. And the reality is you should be as well. You should be a lot more conservative with the negotiations and you should understand that your cost of money is going to go up. So now let me break down the five core fundamentals that every lender like us, I mean, we're actively lending right now, guys. The difference is we're being extremely selective. And what we've also done, and I'll tell you later in, in, in the presentation, is we're working on an alliance with other groups that are specifically getting hyper-focused on markets they're good at. And we're building an alliance so that whenever there's a deal that doesn't fit our box, but it's in that hyper-market, we have somebody to send it to so that we can start serving our client base. But all of the investors across the board that I have talked to that are actually doing business here right now, they've all expressed a very similar tightening of their guidelines, starting with number one, collateral. The very first thing, if you're a wholesaler, if you're a flipper, if you're a landlord, if you're a private lender, the very first thing that needs to change is that we have to be a lot more selective and conservative about our very collateral, which means that it has to be a solid property. It has to have very low loan to values and it needs to be in a market that is very active. So if you're looking at a deal that's in a rural area or in a marketplace that doesn't have a lot of transactions, I don't really care about anything else. If it's a market that I'm not comfortable with, I'm going to be more conservative. So I'm not going to move forward with the deal. So I am going to be looking at more of a hyper local market. I'm going to be looking at a much lower loan to value. And I'm definitely going to be looking at a property that has the solid features that are transacting. It has to conform to that active market. If the property does not conform to the active market, again, it'll be something we're going to dismiss. And you should too. The next piece, if we're doing lending, is we want to make sure that we have a borrower that is strong. We're not going to deal with somebody who this is their first deal going into the coronavirus pandemic. And now we're going to try to talk to them about giving them an, a college education with our money. This is not the time to take that risk. So the first thing we're going to look at is does the client have relevant comparable experience with the property that they brought to us? Do they have actual experience? The next thing we want to know is, hey, liquidity. Does the borrower have enough money, not only to finish the improvements, but to carry the payments for 12 months? You see, before we look at things from the perspective of six months, but now again, we're going back to more conservative and more expensive. But we're going to be looking at the borrower saying, hey, does this guy have 12 months in reserves? And if they don't have it, that's a problem. And in fact, in some deals, we might feel more comfortable having the borrower pay for up to six months of interest up front so that at least we know that the funds for those first six months of payments have already been paid up front. Again, why? Because it protects the borrower, it protects us, and it shows that the borrower that's involved has a true alignment of interest with us. The next thing we're going to look at is credit. While credit isn't a huge you know, picture in most situations, the reality is, let's be honest, credit does tell us what's going on. And so if we see somebody with low, low credit scores, that's going to be a hindrance. And so we are going to have minimum FICO requirements go up. And again, we're going to make sure that we have a down payment. So again, that is component number two of a very, very important criteria that I think each and every one of you should have. Next, the next piece, after we know the actual security of our collateral, after we know the strength of our borrower, is we need to know the exit strategies. And notice how I said it in plural. Why? Because if I'm lending money, if I'm investing in a project or if you're investing in a project to flip it or whatever you're going to do, you have to be able to see a clear path to pay off. You have to have multiple options. This is why I would highly recommend that if you do luxury real estate for investments, that you pause that for now. Why? Because if for whatever reason you can't sell a $500,000 house and you have a mortgage payment, if you have to rent the house, you're going to have negative cash flow. So for us, we're going to be looking at more affordable real estate that have multiple options for cash. Now, we're still looking at an apartment complex right now. It's a really good opportunity. That apartment complex may be a $700,000 loan, but the client is giving us another $1.5 million piece of collateral free and clear as a part of the collateral to be able to protect us and himself. And obviously, those apartments have cash flow that pay the bills. So again, that's what we're looking at is more of the exit strategies. Fourth, and equally important right now is term of investment. Now, you guys know that there were now 30-year loans and two-year loans, and most of the 30-year loans came again from Wall Street. Well, guess what? 30 years are gone for now. So what are we looking at? 
as we navigate through this climate, we might be looking at shorter term periods, meaning you might be looking at six to 12 months instead of 24 months. And so what we'll do is we'll tighten our timeline to make sure that the project works. And if there's an extension that is needed, if the borrower has performed, then we give that person the extension to proceed with holding the property for another 12 months if need be. But the objective here, guys, is we're getting a lot tighter on our timeline to be more conservative with our investment. And then lastly, and this is the last piece of the puzzle, you'll notice how I'm worried about my money. Is, is it safe? Is the guy that I'm working with experience? Are there viable options to get rid of this property? Is this a short-term play? Then after all those answers come in, then I'm worried about my return on investment. So anticipate a higher interest rate because now you're not dealing with Wall Street. You're dealing with investors that have earned this money and now they're going to put it as an investment with you. So don't expect those little eight, nine percent interest rates. Expect those rates to go up with anybody who's playing in the space. So again, I wanted you to get this picture so that you have full perspective of what what is going to happen and what the criteria is. And hopefully I've been clear enough so that everybody can utilize this. Next, what is another action step? So again, we talked about specifically one putting oxygen in your lungs. We talked about getting a little bit more greedy, right? Being more restrictive on the investments you're looking at. The third piece is truly social distancing is critical. We all need to comply with this request. Now, I'm going to bring this back to history. Everybody that I've seen in social media keeps saying, hey, this is the first time we've ever heard the word social distancing. And the fact is, it isn't something new. In 1918, there were literally 500 million people that were infected with the pandemic in the flu. 500 million. That was, at the time, one third of the world's population became infected. And of that number of people, 50 million plus people died from this pandemic in less than two years. Now, you think you're scared that we have whatever, 60, 70, 80,000 people dying worldwide. Now, just put yourself in the shoes for just a minute. Your market stops. You were already in an economic correction because of the war. And every single week, a million people around the world are dying. Now, you tell me how many people would be even more scared than the small number. And don't get me wrong, I'm not belittling the number of deaths right now. I want to put it in perspective. You have people cussing out the president because of the fact that he's saying that there might be 100 to 200,000 people that die in America based on those numbers. Look at the 675,000 people that died back then. Those were insane ratios. And how did they get this situation under control? Well, they didn't have the technology we have. They obviously didn't have the social media that we have to inform the people. So what did they actually do? What they did is they practice exactly what we're doing right now, social distancing. And I'm going to show you a picture that is so interesting. What's the irony of this whole deal right now, we know that New York is the epicenter of this disease. It's spread everywhere. But what's interesting is that in 1918, they were way more conservative. And in fact, New York City began quarantine measures very early, about 11 days before deaths began to spike. So the city had the lowest death rate on the eastern seaboard. So think about that. So if you look at this timeline, what helped them to take this pandemic that killed over 50 million people and have control over it was social distancing. So why do I say this, guys? Because for once, I would say, listen to what the government is saying. Believe what they're saying. This is going to save lives. And if we remain disciplined and committed to each other, when you stay with social distancing consistently, you are protecting your neighbors and those around you and you're helping us to get back to work sooner. Look at this timeline. This is what it took in a pandemic that was substantially more lethal than what we're dealing with right now, at least as of right now. But here's what happens. If you look at St. Louis, that had over 358 deaths per 100,000 people, they actually loosened up a little too early and they had another spike. So they had an actual prolonged period of time. And let me tell you, none of us want this. If this continues this way, we have major problems. So I want to make sure that, again, if you want to take action, you got to make sure that you play the game with everybody else and let's make sure we're safe and we help everybody else. Now, I want to give you some good signs. These are actual current predictions based on mathematical equations you're pulling from actual deaths. This is what they see right now as far as the daily death count. And as you can see here, overall, globally, there's 81,766 deaths as of the 4th. And if you look at this, they're already showing a trajectory based on as long as we keep this consistently, we can see that this is going to level out. So these are great, great news that are proving that social distancing is going to have an impact. 
And so again, this is really, really good news if we all want to go back to work and get back to our lives. Now, how does this have anything to do with the GDP? Let me show you why the faster we get out of this, the faster we eliminate this disease by social distancing and technology and investment. If what you're looking at here is the GDP, and these are some of the top experts in the industry who are actually showing historical charts and their predictions based on what we see right now. So for those that don't know, the GDP is also known as the gross domestic product, which basically measures a total value of financial goods and services produced within a given country's borders. Basically, it is the most popular method of measure, measuring an economy's output and is therefore considered a measure of the size of the economy. And so what you're looking at is a visual of the GDP of our country. And you can see in the crash, but now look at this steep dive. These are the projections. But as we begin to swing to the other side, and once we finally get past this disease, this is what they're actually foreshadowing. They're foreshadowing that we will even exceed the trajectory that we were on because of the pent up demand and because of the additional resources that people are gonna want to get into. So the reality guys, I want you to see this because what you do here right now will determine where you're gonna be when we get here. Whether it's in the beginning, last quarter, of 2020 or whether it's in the beginning of 2021 at the end of the day you can position yourself here so that you can be on top over here and that's what i want to challenge all of you to consider so to put it in perspective this is what i'm looking at based on all the experts and all the data that we're showing as long as we continue doing what we're doing we can expect most likely that the unemployment rate is going to be about nine percent and q2 up to 2020 is going to continue to grow the GDP is going to be impacted substantially by quarter two, about a negative 18%, which is humongous. But you're going to start seeing a recovery by the third quarter. That is if we don't have another prolonged version of this disease. So again, we're seeing that there's potential for acceleration and, of course, a return to full employment by 2023. So I want you to see this. This is what the experts are looking at and projecting if we follow social distancing. So again, position yourselves, guys. I know there's a lot of information here, but I want to make sure that we're all fully informed and really moving forward together. Now, I'm going to wrap this thing up and do the Q&A based on this. So there's a gentleman here that um, was a very, very well recognized and very successful jet fighter pilot out of Vietnam. His name was Charles Plum. And in fact, he completed over 75 combat missions. On that mission, unfortunately, on his last mission, he was shot down and actually he pulled a parachute, landed, and he ultimately was captured in enemy territory and was actually in prison in Vietnam for six years. In a really tiny, horrible location for six years, he was literally speaking to himself positively, saying, I believe in my team, they're gonna come back to get me. And he continued with this positive mental attitude, even in the worst of times, for six years. And finally, his brothers in arms came through they cut a deal. They freed this man. A few weeks into him being back to his norm after being gone for six years in this horrible location. As you can imagine, this poor man was, was having nightmares. And so he went to a little diner. And in this diner that he was familiar with, and he went to get a coffee. He went and sat down by himself. And as he's having his coffee, a gentleman walks by him and says, hey, you're Mr. Charles Plum. And he says, yes, I am. And he says, looks like the parachute worked. And he kind of smiled and Charles Plum looks at him saying like, okay. And he's like, yeah, you survived. So Charles Plum finally looks at him and says, hey, how do you know that? And he says, the reason why I know that is because I packed your parachute. And for 30 seconds in this awkward silence, Charles Plum for the first time realized that he was alive because it was another guy that he never even thought of who was a part of his team. And this man was responsible for packing the parachutes of the incredible jet fighter pilots. And as he sat down, he invited them for, for dinner. They continued the conversation. This was the first time that Charles realized that he had a team. And even the ones who didn't seem like they had a purpose sometimes have the biggest purpose. So my question for you right now during this time is, who is packing your parachute? Who is your ally that is with you through the thick and thin? Who is the person that you've committed to that is committed to you? If we wanna to go to the next level, guys, in addition to getting oxygen in your lung, in addition to understanding a tighter criteria, in addition to putting together the plans that we've talked about to be conservative and doing the social distancing, who is your ally? 
And let me tell you that right now is the perfect time. While everybody has literally had to slow down because of this virus, it is the perfect time to connect with other people and begin to form alliances so that you can position yourself to thrive and not die with this disease. And so what I want to show you is our team right now is we're focused right now diligently on developing alliances with individuals. We're establishing a partnership network with other lender alliances for different strategic markets. So the areas that we don't fund, they're available so that we can become a resource. We're literally signing up more referral partners right now that are agents, mortgage brokers, retail lenders, wholesalers. We're signing up more people now than we ever have before because we're calling everybody to build an alliance with us and we're establishing relationships. We're helping people move their properties and sell them quickly. And at the same time, we're acquiring property. So it's an incredible time for us right now to start building an alliance. If you're not doing that, you're wasting your time. So I want to encourage you, if you fill that form out, www.rickmalero.com forward slash forecast. We're going to give you all these tools for free, but I would invite you to respond and say, you know what? I want to learn more about building a strategic alliance with you. Let's unite during these times and let's achieve so much more that we couldn't do otherwise on our own. That is the key guy. So again, as a company, our goal now is to offer you value, to empower you and to begin to build alliances with you so that together we can achieve the next level. So keep that in your mind. This is the best thing you could be doing right now. Again, a reminder, here's the website. And again, my book, which is Investing with a Purpose, will automatically be sent to you in audio so you can listen to it and hopefully it's a blessing to you. Um, so as we go here, I'm going to now start opening it up to the q and I'm going to knock these key questions that everybody seems to ask. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to go ahead and put a chat in the chat box if you have an additional question that we haven't covered. And I'll try to read them as quickly as possible and address those questions. I already see a few questions coming up, so we'll look at them in just a second. So now question number one, <clears throat> how do you work on renovations or project management in, in situations where your city is on lockdown? Well, the reality is we have to truly adapt, right? We have to truly adapt to our market, but we also have to follow the guidelines. So if you go to rickmalero.com forward slash essential business, you will find a guide that will tell you exactly what you need to do if you're in a business, who's an essential business, what you need to do, and the recommendations specifically for what you should do to still deal with social distancing, but still do your job. Now, if you're in a project right now, guys, and your workers, I mean, I'm, I'm working with contractors right now. Some of them are like, listen, half my subs are working, half of them are not. I can't even finish a project. So what I would say is contact the people that are working with you virtually, see how they're doing, check on them, and either put a timeline together or again, follow this particular resource. I think it'll be very useful. So again, it's rickmalero.com forward slash essential business. The next question that we get a lot is, hey, what are some things that investors can do to mitigate risk in the uncertain times? And my, my real answer, I've already talked about it, but it's literally go back to the basics. Value-based investing is the key to thriving long term. So look at your investments. Don't gamble, don't expect appreciation. Look at the deal and say, what is it worth now? And how can I get it below that today? And make sure that you have multiple strategies. So it's all about value-based investing. The next question is, if you have a mortgage that is maturing and you don't have a contract or is sold, what do I do? Or if you're struggling with your mortgage, let me tell you something, guys. The laws in foreclosure are only for FHA and VA. Private money can still foreclose. So my answer to you is communicate, communicate, and communicate with your lender. I have people right now that have reached out to me that are dealing with maturities. We are being proactive about working with them to structure some type of a short-term extension for those who qualify. We're working with people on that. But if you don't communicate, if you dig your head in the sand, one thing I will guarantee you is that you're gonna have default interest, you're gonna have legal fees, and you're gonna probably lose that property and lose a lot more money that you've already been spending. So the best thing you can do right now is be proactive, communicate. Everybody knows we're on this together. So the more you communicate and you're proactive and you're respectful and the more you work towards a solution, then you're going to have an amicable response. And so we're here to help as much as we can. I and mean, we even have some of our borrowers that we're working with right now that we've sent them the tools. We've helped them to apply so they can get the payment protection program, things like that. So reach out. We'll be happy to help. But make sure that you communicate. So if you don't, that's when you lose the respect and the trust of your lender. And trust me, it will cost you more every single time in the end. Next question, 
how do you find lenders that will close right now? Well, guess what, guys? My name is Rick Malero, and I'm lending. Right? So it's all about word of mouth. When you're dealing with private money, it's back to private back. So it's all about word of mouth. What we're trying to do now proactively, as I said earlier, is we're building an alliance of other institutional, or I should say private lenders, that are specifically focused in certain markets. And what we're doing is we're building an alliance together so that if we get a deal that is in a market that I'm not hyper-focused in, I can send it to them and they can still serve you. So if you have any questions, again, reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you to structure your deal. We'll be able to tell you exactly what to expect. And if it's a market that we're not comfortable with, it's okay. We're building a small network of investors. And understand, it is a small network. We're not talking about every lender on the planet doing business. 90 plus percent of those guys you heard about in the past have literally shut down because of that. So let's make sure that we proceed and let's network together. So the answer is feel free to reach out to our team. Next question. What do I do if I'm a whole, if I'm wholesaling and buyers are not transacting, what do I do? So the first thing I'm going to say is I've been preaching this for years now. If you're a wholesaler that is always worried about making 20, 30 grand, and you're looking at making more money for yourself than the client, chances are you have already burnt your trust with the buyer base. It's not that people are not transacting. We're closing. In fact, this week we're closing two deals. Next week we have a couple of closings and we know of cash buyers buying. The difference is cash buyers are going back to being a lot more conservative and they're only doing business with people they trust. So if they don't trust you, you've lost that customer. And so it's imperative that if you're going to actually grow in and try to transact in this space, make sure that you are conservative like them. Approach it in the same mentality they have and be humble. None of this cocky stuff, showing off checks, say hey, I just made 15,000 on this deal. That stuff only literally raises a red flag for a real investor. You look like a joke. So the reality is be conservative like an investor, look to structure real deals, be humble with your client and offer value and transparency to your investor. If you want to literally establish trust, remember in this pandemic, the only people you do business with are the people you trust. And I am so honored and thankful that every webinar that we've done now in the last two to three weeks, we have literally been packed out with over 100 people every single time. And what that tells me is that people value the, the information that we share because they know that we're being humble about it, we're giving them value, and we're being as transparent as possible to help them to succeed. So apply that same thing in your business, and you'll see people start coming to you to want to transact with you. All right, so before I finish it here, I'm going to now answer any live questions. So I see that there's a, a gentleman here. I said, wow, there's a few of these here. So let me let me go through here. So let's see here. Here it is. With prices so high and probably increasing after this crisis, what are the newest non-traditional methodologies for acquisitions from motivated sellers? Seems old school, bandit signs, direct mail, and so on and so forth. Direct to investors as opposed to direct to investors. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point. And so the reality here, guys, is that, um, in fact, we're doing it. We have a team right now, which funny enough, uh, Sean, I know you're on this call. Uh, we've been working with some of the kids from Ukraine and, and developing them. We now have a team of about five people out there who are texting and communicating. And so the whole idea is we're streamlining it so that we communicate directly with the motivated seller. And then we put them through a process where we begin to identify if they need to sell or if they just want to sell. And so I think what it's going to come down to as, as it begins to grow is connecting with investors or connecting with private sellers and helping them find a solution. It's not about beating them upside the head. If you're a wholesaler or you're a flipper and you have a license, this is a perfect time for you to literally do your marketing direct to the sellers, finding the motivation level and either helping them list and sell their home or helping them buy their home. That's one of the biggest things we're doing right now. And I'm I'm excited to see those numbers as they continue to increase. So I would say that because of this downturn, there might be more resistance with people wanting to sell because they're afraid. But at the end of the day, that, that's going to be it. You definitely are, are dead on. We have to go direct to the actual seller. All right. So now let's here's another Q&A. The Q&A. At the end, I have a question about a 30-year product. Do you have any guidance as to when this will come back? I am a buy, rehab, and hold investor. What a great question. Um, I have talked to probably 15 institutional investors, several of which have bought mortgages from me and have done the 30 years. They literally tell me that the they are in shock at how quickly 
Wall Street backed out on them and that they are looking at the fact that Wall Street is now deeming the private real estate sector as a distressed market. What that means is that they will probably come back online, but they're going to come back online a lot more conservative because they're looking at it like a bigger percentage of the faults. This is a distressed market. And if they come back, they're going to be doing more short terms. So everyone that I have collaborated with, and we've been setting up several webinars specifically with lenders and institutional partners that are doing 30 year programs. They're like, until this thing gets resolved, we have no idea. So what I would encourage you to do right now is if you're a buy and hold kind of person, it's okay. Just make sure that you start bringing in some equity partners for now or get those 12 month loans perform and then ask for extensions. I would say that probably hopefully, in the next year, by 2021, we can start seeing those 30-year mortgages come back. But again, nobody really knows because that's really that's a product that right now does not have an exit strategy. So nobody in their right mind is going to finance for a year right now at those low rates. So, but again, hopefully it'll come back. All right, next question: Could you please uh, bring back the fully populated conversation uh, investing? Hold on one second. I don't even. The fully populated conversation. I, I don't know if I understand. If you, if you, if I think it's Stephen, if you want to just reach out and clarify, I don't really know what you're saying there. So if you, if you just, you know, respond, I'll, I'll look at that again in a minute because I, I didn't quite understand your question. So we're gonna go to Nick. This is a ton of great info. Couldn't take a note fast enough. Any chance I can get a link to replay? The answer is 100%, brother. I'm so glad to hear that you found value in it. We will. We're recording it now. We'll send you the link for sure after this so that you can review it, share it with some of your friends as well. Because the goal, again, is we want to give you value. All right, the next one is we have Anna. Uh, we have when would be the best time to buy multifamilies? Um, I wish it would keep reading, but it's not. Families, since there are a couple of renters that are not paying rent. So that's a really, really good point. And in fact, there's a resource that we have that we can give you if you last which basically talks about major consumer protection. And this website will literally show you what states and how they're enforcing some of these uh, components as far as for compliance. So I would encourage you to go here and review it. Now, as far as your concern, you're right. You're gonna have people that are in default. You're gonna have people that are just struggling. What I would encourage, I mean, this should not discourage you from buying multifamily. You know, if anything, that might give you an opportunity to buy finally multifamily at a higher cap rate, at a higher yield. What I would highly encourage each and every one of you, if you're looking at multifamily, is to make sure that you're proactive. And if you're a landlord, be proactive. Take some of the resources that we are sending you by email and share it with your people. Make sure that they know where to get this government money so they can pay their rent and they can take care of their family for the season. That's more of what you need to do. Uh, and another interesting thing we've seen, we started looking at our portfolio and we're like, great, let's see how many issues we have. We only have one phone call so far. And what's interesting is, uh, the, the the leases that were coming due, meaning within a month or so, <clears throat> they're calling us saying, hey, how do I extend? How do I extend? Because some people now are to the point where they're afraid to be stuck with this coronavirus and be homeless. And so this is a great time to be proactive, talk to your tenants, share with them resources to make sure that they have capital so that you can mitigate that. But yeah, that shouldn't stop you from looking at opportunities, especially if you have the resource. Um, so I got another question about rentals. It says, what do you think about rental property in good location? Yes, 100%. I would absolutely recommend it. Uh, it's it's solid. The only thing I would say is if you're looking at buying a property, buy it like you're going to flip it, meaning that you have plenty of equity. You don't have to buy a property from a wholesaler right now at 100 cents on the dollar or even 89 cents on the dollar. Try to get it as low as you can so that if you have to, you can flip the house and make a profit. Be a little bit more greedy, as I said earlier. All right, so the other question was David Wallace asked, what is the URL for those free tools that you mentioned? Just go to literally www.rickmalero.com forward slash uh, forecast. And when you fill that form out, it'll literally send you an email with everything, all the attachments, everything will be there. So you will see basically what I showed you earlier. You will see, um, it'll go here. Once you're here and you fill out the form, it'll open it up and send you this information with the book. It'll send you all these summaries and some additional resources for you as well. So again, that'll, that'll be really important as well. All right, man, we got a ton of questions. Thank you so much, guys, for being so responsive. All right, so let me go to the next one. 
Okay, here it is. Thank you, Stephen. So you're saying the slide with the house and five elements. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so what you want me to do is to go back to this slide here and kind of hammer it down a little bit more. Let me see if I can do that real quick. Give me just one second. So that's 19. Yes. So, so how much, what am I, oh, I'm sorry, somebody else saying how much great information. Thank you, Desmond. I really appreciate that. I'll read your, your comment in a minute. So uh, to answer your question, Stephen, basically every investor right now, if you're going to be a wholesaler, a flipper, whatever, you really just want to look at these core fundamentals. Uh, the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because if you're going to deal with a private investor that's going to be your partner, or you're going to approach somebody like me and pitch me on funding your deal, you have to understand that because Wall Street money has gone. Every investor has limited resources. So if I only have $25 million left, even though that sounds like a lot of money, what that really is, is a little bit of money over time. But that means that every investor is going to look at the opportunities and be a lot more selective and say, is this the best use of my investment? And so again, you want to make sure that when you're presenting a deal or when you're negotiating, it's a great deal. It's in an active market that the investor is going to have a very solid low loan to value. You're going to have a solid property that conforms to that community. The strength of the borrower, the exit strategies, again, multiple exit strategies makes the deal a lot more attractive to an investor that is considering taking the risk with you. The term of the investment, meaning even if you're going to rent it and that's your goal, one of the key pieces is to show the investor that even though you're going to rent it, you are able to sell this property for a profit in the short term. That's what you're going to do to show the investor that you're safe. They'll be more confident. Trust me. If I invest with you and you're paying me every month and you show me that you've stabilized that property and it's amazing and you come back to me and say, Rick, I need another three months. I'm not going to have a problem working with you for those three months. And so that's really the key. And again, as far as high risk, high reward, like I said, we're going to be looking at a higher yield. I don't know exactly what it is because each deal is different. If you brought me a deal at 40 cents on a dollar, I'm going to be way more aggressive on my rate, but at least expect double digit rates when you're dealing with loans right now, for now anyway. All right, so let's see here. So Desmond here. All right, so as a wholesaler and a new flipper in the middle of a new project, <clears throat> would you recommend I look into refinance options in the short term and waiting to sell is better? So I guess that's a really good question. The answer would really be based on the actual price. If you have a property, and this is what we're finding right now. In fact, I just listed a couple of properties of ours. And uh, what's interesting is anything under 200 grand, we're literally still getting multiple offers. Why? Because what I'm seeing here is the retail market's still there. The rates are very low. And for these people with actual uh, down payment assistance programs, even though they're getting a little tighter on that, at the end of the day, their mortgage payment may be cheaper than the rent they're paying. So there are still people transacting. But once you get past that $300,000 threshold, what we're finding is people that are being more conservative because it's a much bigger commitment on their part. And so we're seeing that there's a slowdown. So if your property is in, you're in the middle of a rehab on a deal and it's a higher end deal, then you may want to consider it. The problem is, are there lenders out there that are willing to refinance a lot of this? So I don't know how you got the money, but I would recommend you have a conversation with them about positioning this to a longer term for now, if that suits you. Um, again, not even non-qualified mortgages are active right now. So if you don't qualify for FHA, VA, there's pretty much nothing out there right now, at least for the short term being. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. And you know me, so shoot me an email. I'll be happy to, to communicate more and get more of that story to help. All right, next one. If you have a flip property under contract, do you think it is better to buy and hold instead? So, like I said, you know, obviously, if you're borrowing from me and you're telling me you're going to flip it, I want I want to see you flip it. But I might say, hey, if you want to hold it, prove to me that it will produce. And so I would do that very quickly in the process. Don't don't wait till like month eight to then go out there and start trying to rent it. If you're going to do that buy it, fix it, lease it, maybe do a lease with an option for a year and then go back to your lender and say, hey, would you buy me time? Would you give me a little bit more time? I've got a tenant who wants to buy it. And so be creative with that. But um, right now, either or, but obviously if you can rent it, great, because when the market comes back, again, you stand to make a lot more money when, when the market starts growing, when transactions really come back. All right, so Jennifer, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Very informative, thank you. You're welcome, Anna. All right, so we have Juan has another one here. Let me see here. So the question is, I have a property rented, but tenants are not working and I'm asking for time to get the government help, but lender is not giving the time to me. So 
you are in what I call a really interesting situation. So hopefully you two have applied. What I would also do, and this is kind of what sucks, if it's private capital, it really is the choice of the lender. And the lender may be under the gun, getting a lot of pressure from his investors as well. So you got to look at it from their perspective. Um, what I would recommend is communicate with them and ask them if there's any possible way that you can do some form of forbearance. What I did with one client, luckily we haven't had, we haven't had a lot of people that are coming to us for that. But what we've done with somebody is actually we took uh, the next 60 days and we've amortized them over four months. So we took two of those payments, we're moving them to month three, and then from month three on, they're going to pay the mortgage payment plus. And so see if you can try to work out a forbearance, just tell them that you want to perform. Uh, if they can't do that, then I would then be a little bit more proactive about helping your tenants to get the actual financing that they need, you know, as far as from the government so they can make your payments. And I'm hoping they'll come up with some type of government uh, piece on that. But again, as of right now, I don't know of any. So if you find anything, let me know. All right. So there's another question in terms of, I'm going to do like two more because I didn't realize there's like 40 something questions here. So, wow, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. All right. So here it is. So uh, also in terms of wholesaling properties, is this a strategy you would recommend shying away from in the short term? Uh, that's a really good question because the reality is when you're doing wholesale, you're generally still buying it at 80, 90 cents on the as is value. That may not be something you want to do. You may want to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, and keep in mind that if you're going to wholesale anything, do it in affordable housing. Do not go into the high end because I don't care if you think you have 100 grand, you'll be very, very unpleasantly surprised when that property doesn't sell. Again, I don't think the values will drop as much as people are afraid of. I really don't. I just feel that the transactions are going to dry up completely in those markets. And so you're not going to see many closings or as many as you would have thought. All right, man, I'll do two more and that's it. Okay, so I've got somebody, wow, give me the whole synopsis here. Let me see if I can open this up a little bit more so I can read it. All right, so I have, I'm building 179 unit, tiny home property, 55,000 per unit, $459 per month on the rentals. Nine lots in revenue, fix and flip rental projects, seeking 5.7 <laughs> for the development loans. All right, so here is having affordable housing. It, it looks like you have a really interesting project. The problem you're gonna find right now is that you're looking at about a $5 million development loan. You need to bring a partner in. Uh, what I would propose, and, and again, this doesn't mean people won't invest. You might be in a position right now that you can do a small private placement offering. So that sounds like a way more advanced question. To ask for a private lender to give you a hard money loan for a development deal, chances are that's not going to happen just because of the current situation in the market. However, what I would do if I were you, if you have this land and you have this real estate lined up, is I would get an attorney, which I can recommend one for you, that will do it affordably, and I would do a small private placement offering that allows the ability to go out there and start marketing and bringing in investors as your partners. That is probably in the short term the best way for you to get activated on that deal. But on the hard money side, development deals, even with the good times, were always hard to finance because of the risk associated with the actual infrastructure development. Alrighty, awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Really appreciate you guys. I'll end it with this one last story and then we'll, you know, again, we'll be following up with you guys soon. So uh, if you'll see, like, you know, I'm a firm believer. I have a, a relationship with the Lord. A lot of people have asked me, Rick, how could you remain positive in these moments? And I can truly tell you that this scripture is so true. God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. And the reason why I have this confidence is because over the years, God has literally and physically manifested himself in my life over the years. And I'll never forget it, the way I even got started in real estate. I was in youth ministry. I, I allowed the work of the ministry to hinder the work within me. And I was struggling. I knew I had to pivot. I knew I had to change and shift gears. But what ended up happening is I realized that as, as I left the church, the support that I had would mean I would have no income, I would be homeless, and I wouldn't be able to do anything. So I'll never forget it. That day, I literally went to the back of the church where there's a little office that I had. I got on my knees and I prayed. And I said, God, this is like the end of the world to me. I don't know what to do. And I literally cried out to God with tears in my face, just, I mean, just weeping to the Lord saying, God, I need you to show me what to do, direct me, guide me, help me. Not even five minutes later, my eyes were still swollen. I was still wiping the tears from my face. My phone rings. And it was one of the mothers uh, from one of the girls in our youth group. She had just finished repairing this beautiful property on the lake. And she said, Rick, I'm calling you because I, as I finished this property and I, I was praying, thinking about who am I going to rent this to? I felt like God told me that you can stay here for free as long as you want. 
Little did I know that as I was crying out to God in the worst of my moments, when there was no hope, no direction, nothing, God had literally spoken to a complete lady that had no idea what was going on, who gave me a home for free. And it was in that home that I got the inspiration to become a real estate investor. And funny enough, how God used an investor to give me a hand up during a time of need. And so I want to challenge all of you, don't allow the enemy to fill you with fear, but seek God because he truly is the strength and refuge for each and every one of us in these times of trouble. So I'll commit to be praying for you, be praying for me, and let's build an alliance together, guys. Thank you so much. Stay tuned for more information. I look forward to working with you guys. God bless.